What's going on, everybody? Welcome to a brand new episode of Virtual Coffee House. Before we dive into the episode, I just want to say Virtual Coffee House is completely non-monetized. It's completely free. It will stay this way forever. It's a way of us giving back as part of our HPMS Ventures Foundation. We host this podcast for the sole purpose of helping musicians, right? Helping music students. This is a podcast for high-performance musicians, right? We bring on career tips. We bring on college audition advice, music school tips, anything you can think of. Entrepreneurship, music business, anything to serve musicians as much as possible. Because of that. So the only way to support us is really leaving a five-star review. And if this podcast really impacted your life, you learned something, please, if you can write us a written review, that would really help us uh, for the podcast, uh, help us with the algorithm. Um, so I just want to say, please do that if you can. That's the only thing we ask you to do. It's not monetized. If you can also share this video, share this episode, share this stream. Whichever way you're listening or watching this podcast right now, we really, really appreciate that. I also want to say we work really, really hard on publishing these episodes. It takes hours to just edit the content alone. I work very, very hard on bringing these tremendous guests on the show. They are literally the best in the music industry. And I always have a passion for serving people and making an impact on people's lives, especially those who are struggling, those who are younger than me, and those who feel so lost in their um, application process for music schools and trying to figure out what is the best way to get in the schools they want to get into to find the music career that suits them the best. Okay, so um, typically you will literally spend $200, $300 per hour just to have private lessons or conversations with these guests but i try my best to make it happen for you for free so i just hope i can impact as many people as possible another way of really helping us is to post on your own social media of what you learned from this episode using hashtag virtual coffee house using hashtag high performance musicians And if you are really, really struggling with your music applications right now, you are a high school music student, you want to go to music schools, but you feel lost, you can always send us a DM with your question. You can also check out my startup, HPMS Venture. Just Google HPMS Venture. It will take you to our startup page. We have our coaching programs. You can also schedule one-on-one consulting sessions with us. We have helped a handful of music students get accepted into their top choices, Eastman, Juilliard, schools in Europe, you name them. So if you really need help, definitely check it out. Now let's get into the content. Great. Well, today we have another very, very special guest, Mr. Joshua Tennis. He was uh, the visiting assistant professor at Indiana University. Jacob School of Music, and right now he currently serves as the Auto Skills Coordinator at University of Michigan. Welcome, Mr. Tennis. So great to have you here. Thank you very much, Stephen. It's great to be here. Good to see you. Great. So uh, let's start by talking about your earlier career as a performer, right? You were, you play the piano, you're a concert pianist, and you worked a lot with operas, different operas. Uh, as I was uh, going through your list of, of ensembles, I was pretty, pretty impressed at the amount of operas there. So what was it like working with operas as a pianist? Yeah, so I, I came, so I'd, I'll give you a little background maybe of my education. I started really as a pianist. Um, my undergraduate degree was in biology and music, and I was a working collaborative pianist at that time and an aspiring dentist. Uh, I applied to a bunch of dental schools at the end of undergrad and um, not not a lot worked out in that path, and I, I think that it was definitely an indication that I should be going into music full time, which is what I always really wanted to do. But there were some pressures to to go into the sciences. So I, I was a working collaborative pianist and putting all the puzzle pieces together, so to speak, working with singers and learning the rep and playing for auditions and learning the opera scores, especially um, and and even a lot of the song literature. So I did that for a while. And I studied music theory and collaborative piano much more formally when I went for my master's degree in New York City. 
Um, so I was still working as a pianist, but now studying music theory more formally. And I, I thought that at the end of my time as a master's student, I really wanted to study music theory even more. I felt like working as a pianist, um, I, I knew quite a bit of the rep at that time. And I wasn't exactly sure that I wanted to pursue uh, some kind of doctoral program in piano performance, whether as a solo pianist or a collaborative pianist. So I went to do my PhD at Florida State University, and I was there for about four years. Um, but yeah, I, I was working as a pianist for a long time and, and still do. Of course, COVID has put the brakes on all of that a little bit in terms of being safe and meeting with performers, ensemble settings, et cetera. Um, so yeah, I, I did work in New York City privately for a while. I worked with a bunch of singers from the Metropolitan Opera for a while. That was a, an absolute delight. And, um, you know, hope to get back to that when I can. But the professor, the, the professor occupation, of course, can take you to all different parts of the country and sometimes very frequently early on in your career. Um, Michigan feels like a great place to be to be settled and, and I'm so delighted to be here. I had a wonderful time at IU while I was there and a great time down at FSU. So yeah, it, it's been a little bit of a lot of things along the way. Awesome. Uh, you mentioned something I didn't catch when I was doing some research. So you were a due degree um, background from undergrad. Did you finish as a due degree? Yes, finished a dual degree, music and biology. Uh, and then went on to a master's program and did another dual degree in music theory and collaborative piano. I, I couldn't choose one or the other. Um, but when I went down to Florida State for the PhD, I had to choose one or the other. <laughs> and I chose music theory at that time. Okay, let's talk about uh, then about these doubling things, because um, that's one thing I was sort of talking about on my uh, Instagram, on my page about this uh, choice of having different path, right? So yeah. you, you sort of experienced both fields, right? The number one field was having something non-music combined with music and then something double music. And I started college as a degree, due degree as well. I was a econ major and clarinet performance. Um, so talk about that a little bit. How were you feeling uh, differently between, you know, have something that's, completely different from music and having something that's sort of related to each other in masters. Sure. Sure. Yeah, that, that's a really good question. I've never actually thought about doing the dual degrees in that way before. So thanks. Thanks for pointing that out and asking that question. I remember in undergrad when I was working on the biology and the music degree simultaneously, that the biology degree always seemed like a lot of work that I didn't necessarily want to do. And I'm not so sure that I was entirely honest with myself about that at that time. But anything that I had to do for the music degree, which I would say was equally rigorous and at times probably even more rigorous than the biology degree, none of that ever felt like I was I was having to do the coursework or needing to do the coursework. It was something that I wanted to do. In fact, it was exactly the work that I went to do first. All of my music homework assignments, uh, preparations for performances, this and that, I, I made sure to do that first. And then the biology and chemistry and physics <laughs> assignments, they would all come second. So it was a lot of work all around, but I think it was clear to me early on that one was probably favored over the other. Um, but, but I enjoyed studying biology and chemistry and physics. I really liked that. Um, there was also something kind of artistic about a lot of those classes, biology labs, chemistry labs, physics labs, the kind of hands-on works, that there was something tangible about that. It, it was artistic in a way. So I, I valued those moments in undergrad, but I think eventually what I learned is that if I was going to be per pursuing two things simultaneously, it ultimately would have to be two fields within music. And that's exactly what I went on to do for the master's degree. Mm -hmm. Interesting artistic in biology that's that's very interesting here so did you so was there a point that um so it sounds like passion was basically driving you to make decisions but was there a point because you know if we think critically right um having a biology degree going to a pre-med field i was assuming that was the path that you chose was probably having a more stable career that more pay was that ever a consideration of yours or no yeah it, it was a big consideration of mine i i think I, I would like to think that I have a, a good balance of, you know, 
type A personality and type B personality and you know, <laughs> working with both sides of the brain. But if there's one thing that I, I have been as a person for as long as I can even remember myself growing up, I have always been thinking about you know, practical elements of life of being able to provide for myself. And unfortunately, I think there are some really harmful stereotypes that go around with the field of music. Society likes to think that if you go into music, you'll struggle. And look, I, I think that no matter what field you go into, there are inherent struggles. So there came a point where I realized that maybe being in, in the pre-med, the pre-dental path in particular, could lead to a lifestyle that might, I don't know, pay more on average than what a musician would get paid. But I, I didn't feel that I would be happy doing that for the rest of my life. And, and I'll tell you what, I've had uh, this job here at the University of Michigan for just over a semester now. And I was a visiting assistant professor at the university, or I'm sorry, at Indiana University before I came to the University of Michigan. And you know, you, you make it work. It, it's being being a professor, I think, is such a wonderful job working with students, watching their progress. This this has just been such a joy. And I don't think I would trade it for anything. So I'm very happy with my choice. And I, you know, I, I hope that I can at least encourage folks who might be thinking about a career in music, either as a professor or a performer. You know, if, if it's really what you love to do, as cliche as this may sound, you'll find a way to make it work for yourself. And I think at the end of the day, music just brings so much joy to musicians. Why, why ignore that? Why avoid that? At least that's my, my thinking. That's something I found as well. Um, you know, experiencing both the music side of things and, uh, you know, the business side of things. I, I do realize that people do music, not mostly not, of course, not for the pay. Um, but people do business is, you know, people would go into investment banking, consulting. If you really talk about it, right, with them and they, they tell you the honest truth, they don't like the industry. <laughs> They're going for the pay. Um, but, you know, I, I, think, I think I completely agree with you. If you can make music work and then the pay is not that huge of a difference, you just might have to work a little bit harder as a musician. Um, I, I know someone who plays in orchestras and they, they do you know passive investments on the side and they're they're just doing fine so i think musicians you're completely right uh, just have to be smart about it and you, you can chase your passion while making a great living i think that also i'll just add one thing stephen that came to mind and it, it's something i thought about a lot years ago now now that i've kind of settled into work as a professor um you know things things are pretty pretty dependable right in terms of pay and benefits and schedule and, and so forth um, but the one thing I'll say is that for, for musicians who want to seek out additional employment, perhaps non-musical employment, as a way of making their music more enjoyable. So if they feel like they're not struggling by way of music, I say go for it. But if your additional non-musical employment perhaps gets in the way and, and is taking away from the enjoyment of your music, then I think probably there are ways to figure out kind of both sides of that scale. I, and, and I agree with you, Stephen. I think that there are a lot of folks who probably find non-musical employment to help pay the bills, so to speak. But at the end of the day, it has a way of stifling their creativity. And I think that's where the outside or additional employment can get in the way. So it's probably just something to keep in mind um, if and when pursuing a career as solely a musician or as musician plus maybe a little something else on the side. Yeah. So for you, you started your teaching career in a pretty early stage, um, quite young, I'd say for the, if you look, if we look at the average age of professors, right? Um, how do you think you make that work? Or for those who wants to teach or go into teaching directly, what are some of your tips to make it work for them? Good question. Um, I will say that I have taught piano lessons from a very early age. And a word of advice would be, as any kind of musician, put yourself in a position, no matter how old you are, where you can be teaching someone something. Get in the habit of being able to communicate clearly any musical concept that you feel is important to share with someone. Maybe these are formal private instrumental lessons or, or voice lessons, although you know the voices are inherent instruments. So I, I like to think of that as instrumental lessons too, in a way. That aside, get used to communicating with people about music. Um, I, I was able to do that a lot, working as a collaborative pianist and a vocal coach, 
also allowed uh, particular opportunities to communicate with singers specifically and to kind of teach them you know let, let's consider the phrase here let's look at the phrase structure let's look at the harmonic underpinnings of this passage let's look for cadences in this passage and this kind of communication is just a way of teaching even though a lot of people might not see it as teaching and then as i went through school i was able to do some tutoring work either in piano or in music theory or in aural skills and eventually when i got to florida state and i was working on my phd I was a graduate student teacher there, teaching assistant at the graduate level for the four years that I was there. So I had all of this experience teaching undergrad classes, ranging from freshmen in music theory one and aural skills one. Uh, I worked with some of the honors undergraduate students. I worked with some upper level undergraduate students in counterpoint classes. So there was all of this teaching experience that I was collecting and participating in at Florida State. When I left Florida State and had my PhD in hand and received the job at Indiana University, I felt really prepared to do it. It was a different kind of teaching. There was more uh, supervising going on, you know, supervising graduate students who would then go and teach undergraduate students. And it, it all just snowballed in a way, in, in a really wonderful way. But I would say, and, and going back to what I was mentioning before, I would say as soon as possible in your career as a musician, teach, communicate about music, communicate with people about music and find ways to talk about music in ways that people will get excited about, in ways that they will understand. It's wonderful practice to talk to non-musicians about music, can't emphasize that enough. And, and I think eventually all of these skills come together in terms of teaching, you know, maybe more professionally, if you will, down the road, say, if you go into a professorship or, or a private studio teacher or something of this nature. Interesting. So you had a lot of teaching experience and, and were you always getting paying gigs to teach or are you just teaching for the sake of learning? Yeah, good question. Um, my early teaching, I remember teaching piano lessons to people for no pay at all because I, I thought it was really fun, you know, to feel like I could teach someone something. I, I finally knew enough to, <laughs> to teach somebody else something. So there were non-paying gigs. Um, when I went off to graduate school, one of the wonderful opportunities, well, a couple of the, the wonderful opportunities I had were to work as a teacher, as uh, I'm sorry, a tutor, as part of a work study kind of program. So either you were offered um, a, a tuition stipend or a little stipend on the side, or maybe some of, uh, you know, may maybe the university helped you with your course materials like textbooks for your own classes. When I was at Florida State, I was on assistantship. So it was an exchange between the university and myself as a graduate student where the university would help with my tuition and offer me a small stipend and I would teach for them. So there are ways to really make this work even as a music student. And then of course, once you're at the, the level of a professor at an institution, then it becomes a more formal contract, of course, between you as an individual and the university. Very interesting. Yeah, it's the same for me. Uh, you know, sometimes people would, you know, DM me on uh, social media and then ask me certain things, you know, I would just answer, I would answer with my, my full honesty honesty and then give them you know as as much as value as i can for free you know i schedule calls and I, i've also given virtual free lessons before and there are people who reach out and want me to have a talk to their students in brazil so I, I certainly enjoy doing that a lot and i think sometimes it's, it's really not about the pay it's like yeah i agree with you're giving back to to the people who um who support you and then you you certainly feel the joy after after giving those feedbacks of course I, I think that's right. I was so very fortunate growing up to have a lot of wonderful and influential musicians in my life who were mentors to me for no pay at all. These were people who, who helped me in musical situations, either by learning a particular piece, learning a particular technique, connecting with the right people, learning uh, the particular nuances of a style, for example. People helped me a lot. And when I have the opportunity to pay that forward and to help other people, you know, it's not it's not all about the pay. Um, but but a word of caution to young musicians is that, of course, you don't want you don't want to be out there never working for pay at the end of the day. You know, this we're we're studying to offer something to people as an occupation. We are putting in the time 
to develop our expertise as musicians, and it is worth something. Just as if you would go to another business, you know, the, the last time I went to the store and, and got, uh, you know, a tea on my way in to teach in the morning, I'm very appreciative of the folks who own the business, but of course I have to pay them for the tea, right? They're offering me a service and I have to compensate them for that. I think sometimes musicians can get a little bit caught in scenarios where what we do, because it is, off, it, it is often a societal offering, right? You know, we, we provide entertainment in a, lot of, uh, in, in a lot of cases. We're often in this position where people think that what we do is just a hobby and because we love it, we never have to work at it, and it, it doesn't necessarily need to be rewarded or compensated. And that, that's not true. Musicians really should be smart business people at the end of the day. So finding that balance, I think, is a good thing. I agree with that 100% as well. Um, and I think that's a big issue uh, with a lot of music students as well. You know, I agree. Do things for free a certain, to a certain degree to generate a revenue, to generate a stream of clients to build a reputation is good. As long as you have that, you have to monetize. I think a lot of people actually take advantage of people doing that for free. Um, you know, they reach out, they get a free lesson, then, you know, they're gone, right? And then if you don't, you're not, you're not smart about it, they're never going to come back again with the pay. So for, for example, doing projects for free, doing gigs for free, you know, even like brand dealership stuff. There were a lot of people reach out to me because I have a somewhat large social media following and then they they say okay here's the, my product this and that and there's no pay talk about like so i didn't take any of them because i want to build my own projects i want to just serve people and then you know pay or not let's talk about down the road but for now i'm still in the stage of serving people but i i highly agree is that music students must be smart about business and they must take some business if it's not from school then you know, educate yourself, uh, learn business. It's not hard to learn that stuff online. And then, you know, now this social media is so, so popular. You can literally, you know, do this podcast, you know, in, in my dorm room and then uh, help people and let people know what, what you want to say. And then you, you can grow following. So yeah, I, again, it's uh, people have to be smart about, about their, their pay is because I agree. A lot of people take that for granted and say it's a hobby, which is, it's a, it's, <laughs> it's a vocation. It's not a job. It's a vocation though. So Okay, let's dive into your uh, teaching a, a little bit for, for music theory and our skills, those more, I'd say, technical stuff for music. Here's something I find when I was taking these classes uh, freshman year or so. It's, I know the importance of it, but somewhat I don't feel it's that practical connecting to what I do, for example, as a clarinetist, as a performer. So how do you tackle with that or what are some of your suggestions for students to, because it's very important to learn music theory, but in a practical way. Agreed. These are perennial questions, as you can imagine. These, these are the questions that most students are asking. And I'm glad that they do ask them because it keeps music theorists, it, well, it, it really keeps professors in general, instructors in general, honest about what they're doing and why. One thing that I always offer to my students, and I've, I've had, I've had um, a great time teaching both written theory courses. And now here at the University of Michigan, I'm overseeing the entire oral skills program. So I, I've been in both worlds. One thing, especially in written theory, we, we can start there maybe, is that I believe that written theory has the great ability to teach students style. And when you learn style, you learn musical predictability and tendency. And the ability to kind of predict the future and develop your musical intuition within a particular style, I believe pays dividends just endlessly and very greatly. I ask students all the time, um, how, many, how many of you by show of hands would like to go and be you know, a, a successful musician, whatever that means to you in music? And everyone raises their hand <laughs> invariably, right? How many of you will probably have to go and play for an audition at some point or, or perform an audition? Many people raise their hands. How many of you uh, in that audition setting will probably have to do some kind of sight reading, 
either at your instrument or by way of your voice. Many hands are going up again. <laughs> so how does sight reading become easier? Well, one way that it might become easier is by being able to kind of predict the style of a particular composition. How do you know what might be upcoming? You know, let, let's say, for example, that one is performing an excerpt from the classical literature, and we don't need to have any composers in mind. We'll just think kind of the classical style. And, and there are definitely some definitive features of the classical style, as there are in any other style. By way of studying these, these particular styles and developing your musical intuition about what usually happens in a sight reading setting, you probably have a good sense of what's upcoming. And that sense of what's upcoming can generally be translated or transferred to the performance of what it is that's upcoming. So this ability to predict the future and understand stylistic expectations, I think is really helpful. Um, you, you can do this by way of improvising. I think that stylistic improvisation is a wonderful tool for developing one's own sight reading skills. You're, you're almost doing the reverse process of sight reading in a way. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think that it's all about learning these kinds of nuances. And it's not just arbitrarily placing some Roman numerals under a score that your professor hands you, right? Or, or using some other terminology in the field of music theory to, uh, to get the right answer on the homework. It's about developing a sense of how certain musical styles progress through time, through the span of a composition. And I, I think that's so rewarding. And I think it makes being a listener to music too, wonderfully rewarding. Think about those moments when you're listening to a composition that perhaps you've never heard before, but the general style is one that is familiar to you, and all of a sudden your expectations about what is going to come next are completely thwarted. That's what makes being a listener wonderfully exciting, when music doesn't go where we think it's going to go. But we really won't have a reaction to uh, either kind of confirming that the music went where we thought it was going to go or saying, wow, we were tricked in that moment. We, we won't have that reaction if we don't have some understanding of style to begin with. And I think that's where music theory and aural training really come into play. Very interesting. That answers the, I think, major my major confusion about music theory because I was more of taking music theory as this technical stuff that's non-practical. Well, that answers that question. But one thing I'd say about oral skills, it's, I think it really helps with my ears. Um, I remember one, that this is something I hardly could do before, was to hear different layers and colors of a solo concert, right? Let's say a piano recital. And it was my highlight of, highlight of the year last year 2021, when I went to, you know, CSO, Chicago Symphony Orchestra, but, but to hear Long Long's uh, Goldberg Variations, Bach's Goldberg Variations uh, recital. And that concert was like, I don't, I don't know, probably an hour, 20 minutes, but I was paying attention the whole time uh, without being distracted. That's rarely, that rarely happens to me because usually I feel, you know, a bit distracted during a long period of classical concert. But I was paying attention because I can I can just literally hear all the different layers or different colors of the piece. And that was fascinating to me because I never had that feeling before. And I think fundamentally, if I didn't have, you know, one year of year training here in school, I would not pick it up because I would just hear, go to orchestra concert, hear different instruments. But the sense of coloring and layers from one single instrument was truly, truly fascinating to me. Yes, I, I agree. You know, there oral, oral skills to me can mean so many different things. In an oral skills class over the course of the semester, there are myriad activities one can do with students or ask students to, uh, to complete on a homework uh, assignment, for example. So it, it does all come back to truly the ear training, to be able to look at a piece of music and without making any sound, understand what that sounds like in your ear and in your mind. I, I think that's really the goal of oral skills. And it, it goes beyond that. Pattern recognition in music is so important, right? And we're, we're trained in music to be listening to patterns. We respond to patterns so frequently. I think that patterns come into play not only for listening, listening pleasure and kind of contextualizing what we're listening to, 
in a composition, but pattern recognition is directly related to studying a piece of music that one might be performing, for example, or that one might be analyzing in order to discuss it in a scholarly way, you know, for, for the folks who may be more interested in academic music disciplines, like music theory or musicology or ethnomusicology, rather than just for performance. Um, oral skills engages error detection. If you're looking at a score and listening to a recording, you can, you know, you can make some decisions about, well, isn't that interesting? In this particular recording, I think I heard an F sharp, but written in the score was an F natural. I need to look into what's going on here. Maybe I should look at other versions or other editions of this score. And maybe I should approach my study of this score more carefully or more critically in this matter. And that, I, I think that's a really wonderful thing to do too. Um, oral skills, developing the ear, I think engages the art of ensemble work, right? Participating in music with other people, at least in, in my sight singing and oral skills classes here at the University of Michigan, I constantly encourage my students when sight singing either melodies or even just sight singing rhythm exercises, don't stop, right? In an ensemble setting, if you're working with, say, four or five or more other musicians, you can't just stop in the middle of a rehearsal and say, you know, one moment, please, I just need to take a second look at what's going on here in the score. So training, training one's oral skills, you know, training the ear, training the ear and the eyes to interpret in order to uh, be able to make sound with your voice or to convey on your own instrument. You know, all, all of these things are really very much related and very important. And then of course, people always argue that oral skills are very important for the development of relative pitch. That is uh, one's ability to make associations between pitches. And this differs from absolute pitch, of course, which is a very different kind of thing. But I do think the development of relative pitch is a really wonderful and necessary skill for all musicians. And usually in the oral skills classroom, the, the different kinds of activities that we would participate in are all helping to achieve these particular goals at the end of the day. Awesome. Fantastic. One last thing I do want to ask um, before we wrap up here is sure. for students who are, let's say, okay, so music theory, art skills, that these are kind of the things that sort of you can only get formal education in college. If you didn't go to like an art school or music school for, you know, preparatory programs back in, um, in high school, which I had the fortune to have, but I, I imagine a lot of students didn't have these kind of resources. What are some ways to still get this education to help them grow as a, as a musician as a whole, but from online or anything else? Uh, what are some of ways that you recommend them start doing like in a younger younger stage in their music career? Sure. Yeah. Really, really good question. And I, I think that there are many ways one could accomplish this. Um, a couple of things that come to mind. There, there are really practical things that come to mind, like a handful of free websites, online websites that anyone can access for free in order to begin training their ears. These websites may present uh, interval training. So note to note, you know, melodic intervals, we hear a note, then we hear another, what's the interval between? Or harmonic intervals where you hear two notes sounding simultaneously, what is the interval generated between those two notes? Uh, you, they, they can train you for determining the quality of triads and seventh chords and short chord progressions and so forth. So there are a lot of free online resources for the kind of beginning stages of oral skills, sight singing, uh, written theory, all, all kind of folded uh, in, in together. Beyond that, I think one of the most important things to do as a musician as early as possible is listen, listen, listen. Listen to pieces that you believe will have similarities to one another. For example, pull out a, a set, you know, well, a, now, nowadays with YouTube and all of these other things, Spotify, it's so easy to find collections of music, right? Um, maybe, maybe go through some string quartets from a particular style period and just listen. And as you're listening, think about what seems similar in the overall musical organization or the overall sound in these compositions? And you don't have to get technical about it. You know, students at an early age need not know the names of all of their cadences 
or names for musical phrase structures or small musical forms, for example. You don't have to know these things to hear these things. Later on, you'll be able to put a word, a term, with all of the things that you're hearing. And I, I think in many ways that's what the, the college curriculum in music theory and oral skills helps to do. It is to actually be able to make sense and, and define exactly what we're hearing and how those things are constructed. But, you know, listen to things like, uh, it, in, in the very beginning of the first movement of these string quartets, I hear these things. Or, or after so long, I hear the music from the beginning of the movement repeat at the end of the movement. You know, these, these are just simple things that we can listen to. And I, I don't think we necessarily need a formal training to engage with them all the time. So listening is so important. And I guess the last thing I would say, engage with your music and sight read or sight sing through excerpts and passages as often as possible. I don't think there's any more, uh, there, there's any other skill in music, uh, as especially an early musician, more valuable than just reading constantly. Read through things at your instrument. If your instrument is not your voice, sight sing through things. Engage your voice in music making outside of your instrument. I think all of these things are, are very important. And, and maybe, I, I know that was my last thing, but I just thought of one more of course, <laughs> that, I, of that I encourage students to do all the time. Listen to a passage, a short passage, and sing it back or perform it at your instrument. This, the, the ability to hear, to make sense of what you're hearing, and to perform back with your voice or your instrument is extremely important. This could be just... Uh, elements of rhythm, you know, even if you're listening to a particular melody, can you can you uh, say, speak on ta, the rhythm of that particular passage? Or can you listen to the melody with all of its rhythmic features and can you sing it back? You don't have to sing it on solfege or scale degree numbers or note letter names or, or any of these methods, but can you listen, internalize, and sing or perform back what you're hearing? What a wonderful way to develop a musical ear. I, I think that one is, is equally important. Sorry, I, I started ranking things only for them to all be <laughs> ranked and rated completely equally. <laughs> great, great. These are definitely great tips, tying back to, to your natural sensitivity, right? Tying back to your voice. I never thought about it like that because I always felt like my clarinet was my voice. But of course, clarinet is different than human voice in many different ways. Um, Fantastic. Well, Mr. Tennis, it was such an honor and such great, great feedback from all of those questions. And I certainly really enjoyed our conversation. Likewise, Stephen. Thank you so much for having me. This was great. Amazing. Thank you again, Mr. Tennis. Yeah. Have, a, have a great day for you. You betcha. Thanks, Stephen. All the best. Thank you. Bye-bye.